care to, I would like to continue our little series on discovering our children in a uh, biblical perspective, in biblical parenting. Children are the future, and they're with us today, and they are the most valuable possession. You know, the Bible says that we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out of this world. And the most valuable thing that we will leave behind is our children. The most valuable thing that we possess, I dare say, is our children. And so what I want to do is I want to look for characteristics in our children. We have been studying, we've used for the base of this passage, Proverbs 30 and verse 22. So let's go back there before we begin to Proverbs chapter 30 in verse 22. And in this passage, Solomon says, and again, this is a proverb, so it is a generality. But Solomon says, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. I gave you the wrong, wrong passage. I'll get there. Anyway, we have been studying the passage that says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. I'll find it here later on. I've got it, but I want to think about that as parents, we shape and mold our children. So today I want to look for characteristics in our children. And I would like for us to turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 139 and in verse 13. In the psalm here, the psalmist is giving us an idea about children as God views children. Psalm 139, and in verse 13, the psalmist says, For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hid from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet... There was none of them. What I want us to understand is that every single child is unique. Every single child has different characteristics. Now, someone has said, multiple people have said, you know, your children all look alike. Well, my children certainly carry certain characteristics. But I dare say that not any two of them look exactly alike. Hair color is different for some. Some of my children have different eye color. Their voices are different. Some of them, their body shape. I've got a few that are very thin and very frail. Abigail falls into that category. She's always been a very small child, petite child. Then I've got others like Peter and Silas who are just bulky children. And, and and much, much tougher build. Just, just my two older boys alone, you can see a vast difference, not only in personalities, but in, in physical builds. Um, and even in their interests, their moods, their abilities, all of those things are different. God intertwines all of these in, with, with intricate threads in a unique pattern to create every child as a masterpiece. We call this intricate thread a DNA. Now the psalmist, when he wrote Psalm 139, had no idea that later, centuries later, we would be talking about this as DNA. But that's exactly what the psalmist is describing in Psalm 139, are characteristics that we know of as genetic or DNA. These characteristics will become more visible as each and every child develops, as they grow older and develop into their own individual person, those characteristics become more visible. Attributes. 
and flaws. God himself forms each person at conception in the womb, from conception until actually, I believe, really up until adulthood, God continues to form our children and make them who they are. And we as parents should value each person as God's creation, his masterpiece. Because God has made my child, he knows all the aspects of each of my children, all ten of them. Now, as a parent, that should be encouraging. Because if God knows every aspect of my children, then I should be able to go to God and ask God for understanding and insight into each one of my children. I have to say there are children that are more challenging than others, that require a different type of attention than others. There are children that are easier as a parent to relate to, and there are children who are more difficult to relate to. But all of my children, each one of them is fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And I can take delight in each of my children as a wonderful treasure from God. Each one of them is special and unique. I want to look at here at Psalm 139. If we look at just verses 1 through 6 while we're here. We didn't begin here. But let's look at verses 1 through 6 and see how much God knows each one of us as individuals. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before the world, uh, before a word is on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. The psalmist here. God knows him. The psalmist is amazed. He is impressed with God's personal knowledge. So much so that he says before a word is formed upon his tongue, God knows it. That's the way it is with our children. That's the knowledge that God has of our children. If we continue reading in verse 7, the psalmist is now amazed that God is with him. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? He says, I cannot escape. God. God is with him all the time. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I, if I make my bed in Sheol, if you're reading from the King James, it might say hell, but it's Sheol, the place of the dead. If I make my place there in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even in the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. Here the psalmist is amazed that God is with him everywhere. As parents, as parents, God is walking with us. As parents, as we teach and train our children, God is there. He is not going to forsake us in our darkest time. As children, God is with you. He is there. He is not going to forsake you in your darkest hour. He will be there. He will be present with you. And then the passage that we looked at, God made us. He made each one of us individuals. He made each one of us unique. God made us the way we are. We just need to realize that God did not make a mistake. 
Some of us may have more, be more challenged in certain areas, but God created us. Now, if we drop down, instead of reading what we've already previously read, if we drop down to verse 19, I want you to notice here in verse 19 that God searches us. Oh, what, oh, that you would say, slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist here is challenging God to know and to understand his heart. And yet God knows. God knows and God understands the psalmist's heart. He knows his intents the same as he knows our intents. The same as he knows a child's intents. What I want you to notice in this chapter is the hand, God's hand, in the characters of our children. As parents, if we acknowledge that God's hand is in our children, then we can better understand God's intention for them. As a parent, it's very important. I think this is the number one mistake that parents make. As a parent, I want my children to like what I want. I want them to like doing the things that I do. I want them to, it's almost like as a parent, you almost see a, an opportunity to have a second chance at life through your children. We've got to guard against that. Good shot. We cannot live our dreams through our children. We cannot, we should not change God's design in our children to try to live our dreams through their lives. They have dreams of their own. And they need, we need to, we need to encourage the good dreams. But we need to accept that they have dreams and aspirations of their own. So avoid changing God's characteristics. Do not try to make an artist into an athlete. You're not going to succeed. And you're going to bring your child a lot of heartache and a lot of frustration. And you are going to drive a wedge between yourself and your child. I want to put that out there because I think that is possibly one of the biggest mistakes that parents make. And it is a mistake that I have tried to avoid although it's difficult. Applaud your child's good qualities as they emerge. If you see something positive as a parent, if you see something positive, my, my little girls are crazy about this. They always, Papa, look what I did. And I look at the drawing and I'm trying, well, what is it, sweetheart? And they have to explain it to me. It's wonderful. And it's something that we as parents need to be excited about. It's just like when they, they feel like they've accomplished something, we need to draw that out of them and encourage them, even if it's not something that we're good at. I mentioned coon hunting. My boys aren't here today, so I'll mention it again. I never wanted to coon hunt. I'm not even sure that my boys, but I, I've never been a hunter. It's just not, it's not who I have been. Now, I go out deer hunting once in a while. I go out squirrel hunting once in a while. But it's not something that I've ever lived for. My boys, on the other hand, they are all boy. And they love that stuff. 
And I found myself, what I need to do is spend more time with them in the woods to encourage them in what they love to do. I'll tell you what, as a parent, if, if you're not into that, that can be a little challenging sometimes. But it's a quality that I don't want them to give up on something they love. And again, we need to celebrate each child's unique gifts rather than showing favoritism. I've seen this happen in the church. I've seen it happen in families. Uh, there'll be you, you'll have, a parent will sometimes have a favorite child. That is never good. Not for the child that is your favorite. Amy, would you happen to be a favorite child? Mm -hmm, I thought so. Okay. Um, it's, it's never good. It's not good for the favorite child, and it's not good for the unfavorite children either. But it's something we need. To, we need to celebrate our children and show and love them. But we need to try. And, and as a parent of ten children, it's it's very difficult sometimes to show that equally to all of our children. And sometimes I don't think I do a very good job of that. And I want to talk to you about what I would consider genetic challenges. Every person, we take on a certain characteristic of our parents. This, this passage right here in the book of Psalms. And we're going to look at some other passages that I think demonstrate that each child, while they are individuals, they carry some of our genetics with them and some of our personalities Consequently, some of our children are probably going to face some of the same challenges that we face. Okay, something that is, is historical in my personal family is alcohol abuse, tobacco abuse. I'm, I'm at least fourth generation drunk. Okay? And it's something that I, I have never taken a drink. I've never had a beer. I don't like the smell of beer. But I'll tell you what, I have always viewed myself, because of my family history, I've always viewed myself as having an addictive nature, and I believe that it's true. It's something that every generation, for like I say, at least four generations of my family has struggled with. Some people don't struggle with it because they don't have the genetics to be addicted, okay? But there are other things that come into play. Have you ever noticed you see your children and they're growing up and they're so sweet and then suddenly... You see your worst personality characteristics coming out in them. And you're like, whoa, that was a flashback of me that I do not want to see. Some of those things are genetic and some of those things take spatial challenges to help get them over those things. Our job as parents, discovering how our children are made, cooperate and encourage the good characteristics, but our greatest challenge might actually lie in helping our children overcome their weak points. And Satan is going to know where those weak points are, and he's going to play on those weak points. Okay? I used alcohol as an example. I don't necessarily struggle with alcohol, but I'll tell you what. The greatest smell in the world is Prince Albert pipe tobacco. I love that smell. Now, there's cheap tobacco. I don't go for cheap tobacco. Now, I don't smoke. But generations of my family have smoked. And I still remember my great-grandparents and my great-uncles smoking Prince Albert pipe tobacco. That smell. One of the challenges that we may have is to help our children deal with some of these things. And I'm not saying it's all genetic. 
but there I believe that certain certain family histories would indicate that there are genetic things, genetic challenges that we have to overcome. I want to go to Proverbs chapter 22 for a moment. Look at what Solomon says here in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15. Solomon says, folly is bound up in the heart of the child. Okay, folly. Stupidity. Let me, let me rephrase that. Stupidity is bound up in the heart of a child. Just believe me, all of, our, all of us have a certain amount of that stupidity that we're born with. And we're going to make stupid, dumb mistakes. Okay, so every once in a while, one of my children will do something that is, and they'll come in, Papa, I got hurt, Mama, I got hurt. And Kate, being the sympathetic mother that she is, she will look at them and say, well, that was stupid. And, you know, and, and then we talk about, okay, what did you learn from this? Did you learn not to run, not to run out in front of somebody who's riding a bicycle? Did you learn that you should not be walking the rafters of the greenhouse? Folly, folly, foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. Solomon says the rod of discipline drives it far from him. We can't argue with that. You can you can talk to me about what a rod is all day long. And I don't care what your definition of a rod is. The rod of discipline. Certain children require different amounts of discipline. Dylan's over there. I think he's had the rod of discipline before. No. <laughs> so... But the rod of discipline drives these things out. Any, any living creature, any living creature, and human beings are living creatures, we respond to what? Two things. Pleasure and pain. Right? This is one of the reasons that I believe in spanking children because we tend to respond to pain. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I'm not promoting child abuse. We don't want to go there, but we do respond to pain. Look here while we're in Proverbs. Look at chapter 23 and verse seven. <clears throat> For he is one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsels that you have eaten and waste your pleasant words. Sometimes our children, we underestimate their minds. They're like little computers. It's always going. They're always calculating. They're always trying to figure out. They learn us sometimes before we learn them. Children are born in innocence. If someone tells you that children are born with a sinful nature, disregard them. There is a, there's prominent religious teaching out there that will tell you that children are born in sin. Children are not born in sin. They are born in innocent. Children learn sin, but children do not know the difference between right and wrong at an early age. Matthew chapter 19. If children were born, in, born as sinful individuals, Jesus would never have said what he says in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14. Jesus says, but, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them 
and went away. What Jesus is saying right here, and the, the lesson that the disciples needed to learn was that they had to become innocent, naive, if you will, as little children in order to inherit the kingdom of God. Christianity would teach us that we have to become like little children. We have to be willing to learn. We have to be willing to forgive. We have to be innocent in every way, shape, or form. Okay? If, if children were born with a sinful nature, that passage would never have been written. Ezekiel also says that the child, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. But everyone, and I'm paraphrasing here, every one of us will answer for our own deeds. However, Satan is real, Satan is alive, leading the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 to write, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone who is old enough to account for their own actions has sinned. Everyone who's old enough to account for their own actions at some point has given way to Satan's temptations falling short of the glory of God. So there we may say genetic challenges or they may just be simple temptations. Satan's evil appears in the form of in children, it appears in the form of defiance. Sometimes in adults, it appears in the form of defiance, disobedience, out of control temper, sneakiness, lies, and the list could go on. But these are things that we've experienced. They're things I've experienced in my own life. They're things I've experienced in my children's lives. Defiance disobedience, out-of-control tempers, sneakiness, and lies. As I said, we could go on with the list, but these are things where Satan reaches into a child's innocence and tempts them while they are weak. We'll take a closer look at those things in the study, but what I want us to do today is, you've heard the saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Now, again, I don't want to lay too much credence on genetic challenges, but there's such a thing as environmental challenges, too. Children learn from their parents. I want us to look at the following verses. There are several of them, and I believe that these deal with generational challenges. I've talked to people who have adopted children and they've had different challenges with children that they've adopted versus children of their own. Now, I think part of it is personality differences. Part of it is genetic. I also think a part, portion of this is learned. Learned. Children spend more time around their parents than with any other human being for at least the first six years of their lives. And during those first six years of life, they learn from us. They learn from us. Exodus chapter 20, and I would like to begin in verse 5, where Moses records for us, he says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, what, what I want us to see is if, if what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19 is correct, if what Ezekiel says is correct, that we rise or fall based upon our own individual merits, what in the world is God talking about here? I believe God is talking about learned characteristic flaws. We can look at, uh, we'll look at um, Exodus chapter 34. I've got several passages. I don't want to dwell on them for time's sake. But 
Ezekiel chapter, or Exodus, sorry, chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. For time's sake, you can write down and look up Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. Deuteronomy is basically a repeat of Exodus 20, verse 5. Um, Deuteronomy 5, 9. You can write those down. Go back there and read those. They're, they're important, but basically they all carry the same philosophy. To the third and fourth generation, what I want to do is I want to call this learned, learned sin, or we could call it learned behavior. If, if Moses writes that God visits iniquity on the third and fourth generation, we as parents need to be very cautious what our children learn from us because it can be a challenge for them and it can lead them to fall. But if, if God says that he visits iniquity on the third and fourth generation, then there should be a Bible example of this. Would I be correct in saying that? What I want to notice, I, I picked Abraham. Because Abraham is a, a pillar of faith. He is a good man. He is a, he's an icon of our faith. And we use Abraham for all kinds of wonderful illustrations. But I'm not sure that Abraham was a great father. And I'm not sure that Abraham was a great parent. As great of a man as he was, he made mistakes. And we're going to learn. We're going to learn from his mistakes because our children learn from us. I'm going to try to keep this moving as quickly as I can. But if you look at Genesis chapter 12, I want you to notice an event that happens in Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 12 and in verse 10. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 now there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a, a, that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abraham entered Egypt, Egypt, the Egyptians saw the woman was very beautiful. And then the prince of Pharaoh saw her. They praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and for her sake he dwelt well with dealt well with Abraham, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. What did Abraham do? He told a lie. We're going to see, I think, and try to demonstrate that this is this is a character flaw in Abraham. I don't want to say it's genetic, 
I want to say, though, that it is a weakness in his character. He's prone to lie. If we go to Genesis chapter 20, look over here, and you will see Abraham cultivates this sin in his house. Now, when, Abra when, when Genesis chapter 12 takes place, Isaac is nowhere around. Isaac is not born yet, and so we, we really can't necessarily definitively say that Isaac learns this from his father. But years later, I want to show you that this is, a, this is something that is not a once and done deal for Abraham. God has chastised him by the mouth of Pharaoh. Genesis chapter 20, I want us to look at verse 11 and 12. And if this sounds familiar, it might be familiar. Abraham said, well, actually, we could back up a little bit farther here in chapter 20. But what happens is basically the same thing over again. And Bimelech, king of Gerar, is the one instead of Pharaoh in this instance. I want to begin in verse 1. I was going to cut some of this out, but let's begin Genesis 20 and verse 1. From there Abraham journeyed towards the territory of Negad and lived between Kadesh and Sur. He sojourned in Gear, and Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gear, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man. Because of the woman whom you have taken, she is a man's wife. Now, Abimelech had not appeared, approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And he said, and she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hand, I have done this. Then the Lord said to him in, in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants to him, them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have you sinned against how? Have I sinned against you that I have brought that you have brought on me in my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? Abraham said, I did it because I thought there was no fear of God in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister and the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. She became, and she became my wife. And then God accused, God cursed, caused me to wander from my father's house. I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me at every place to which we come, say he is my brother. Abraham made some grave mistakes. Now, he's not, it's not all out lie in his defense, but it's not truth. 
I think what you see here and what you see back in chapter 12 is that Abraham is a man of half-truth and half-lie. I want you to know so this, this goes to the next generation. The Hebrew writer says this of Abraham, that he is our father in faith. I don't want to discount Abraham as being a great man. He, like us, is human and was and made mistakes. Hebrews 11, verse 8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to a place that he was to receive as an, as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations. His designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past age, since she was considered, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him, as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the immeasurable grains of sand by the seashore. Abraham. Though a father in faith, his faith was in obedience to God, but yet it wavered. Sarah, her faith, was in obedience to God, and yet her faith wavered. Faith was fulfilled in Christ. Now, Isaac is the next generation. And again, I know this is, we're, we're running short of time. But Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. I want us to go back here and see what Isaac did. I believe that Abraham set the precedent for his family. And Isaac learned from this precedent that was set in his family. Genesis 26, verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land. Sound familiar? Besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Gear, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Now this is thought to be a grandson of the Abimelech that Abraham and Sarah dealt with. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Uh, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in the land and I will be with you and will bless you. For you, have, you and your offspring I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath I swore to Abraham your father. Okay, just, just pause right there for a moment. God is telling him where to go. God is telling him that he is going to preserve him. I want you to see what happens is that in this generation things just go the extra mile. Abraham told a half truth. Isaac dropped down to verse 7 actually verse 6. Isaac is going to tell a full blown lie. So Isaac settled in gear. Then the men of the place asked him about his wife. He says she is my sister. Can't we think of a new line? Can't we think of something different to say? For he feared to say she is my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill him, or kill me because of Rebecca, because she was an attractive in appearance. Moral of the story, marry an ugly woman. <laughs> okay, bad joke. But, but still, what we've got here is We've got a problem. This is a learned behavior from his father Abraham. I'm convinced of that. When he had been there a long time, and Bimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw Isaac. Now, your King James Version, I like the way it reads. It says sparking with Rebecca. Sporting, I think it is. Sporting, I'm sorry. 
Now, my Bible says Isaac laughing with Rebekah. Now, that's a pitiful translation. Okay? That's a pitiful translation because I can laugh with anybody, and that does not mean I'm married with them. Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought, lest I die because of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Drop down to verse 13 very quickly. And the man became and, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. It's Isaac. Again, I'm not faulting Isaac. I believe Isaac is a great man, a man of faith like his father, but he, like all of us, had character flaws. In Genesis 26, God made a promise in verse 3 right here. We just read it a moment ago. Sojourn in the land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you for all. For to you and your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath I swore to Abraham your father. Didn't God just tell him he was going to take care of him? And what's he do? He starts to think about it. In Genesis 26 and verse 10, it's a non-believer that sets Isaac straight. Sometimes the outsiders have more faith than we have. I believe that speaks highly of Abimelech, king of Gear. Again, it's a learned challenge. Jacob is now the third generation, and with his mother, Rebekah's help, brings again not a worse, still worse sin in his home. Deceit, Genesis 27, verse 1 through 29. I'm not going to go there for time's sake, guys. I know we're running up against the clock, and I, I am aware of that. But remember what happened? Jacob deceived his father, lied to him, so that he could steal his brother's birthright. Rebecca helped him. She dressed him up. This sin is becoming greater and greater. Sin left unchecked is going to get worse in the next generation. This is why it's important for us to teach our children. This is why it's important for us to understand the sin that we allow in our lives our children see, and it becomes worse. Do you know statistics show that if a child grows up in an abusive home, statistics show that child will then himself, him or herself, most likely be in an abusive relationship because they think it's normal. The child who hears lies will most likely grow up and tell lies because they think it's normal. They catch on. And finally, what I want to do is I want to go into Genesis chapter 37. And I want to go to that final fourth generation. When, when, when God says years later, this is a few hundred years later, when we read in, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, God visiting iniquity upon the, those that do evil to the third and fourth generation. This is an example of exactly what happened. Genesis chapter 37, I want to begin in verse 3 of that chapter. Genesis chapter 37. And in verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph. Israel is Jacob. 
He loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was a son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. There's problem number one. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him but could not, and could not speak peacefully to him. So there's what something that I noted is a challenge, is favoritism. And I want to drop down in that same chapter to verse 31. Almost to the end of the chapter here. Then they took Joseph's robe. This is his brother's. They've sold him into slavery. They took his coat. Says then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe with many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. You see what happens? We go from a half-truth, she is my sister, to a full lie, she is my sister, to a bigger lie and deception, this is your son Esau, to the point where we're willing almost to commit murder and tell a lie that Joseph was destroyed. However, what we see, if I were to stop there, you would get the point on parenting. But what we see is Joseph. Joseph, a man of God, is willing to take a stance for the truth in Genesis chapter 45, even though, even though it may cost him dearly. Genesis chapter 45, I just want to read verses 1 through 4. Then Joseph could not control himself before those who stood by him, and he cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He was going to lie. He had it in his mind to deceive them yet again, and Joseph did not. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. They were afraid. They were fearful. They were afraid of a man whom they thought to be dead. They were afraid of the lie that they had told their father. Jesus in John chapter 8 says this know the truth and the truth will make you free there's no place there's no place in parenting for deception but there's no place in parenting for letting our own sin be carried on into the next generation we've been studying Timothy in our Bible class Timothy is a result of parenting done right. He's a result of parents, particularly a mother and grandmother, who taught him the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, well, if we back up a little bit maybe, now verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it dwells in you. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
Faith is learned. Lies are learned. Sin is learned. It's learned from us as parents. As parents, let's be positive influences on our children. And the first thing we need to do is to get it out of our lives if it doesn't belong there. The sooner we get it out of our lives as parents, the sooner our children will no longer see sin. And they'll no longer accept sin as okay. There's sin in our lives today. Let's let's get rid of it. Let's remove it out. Let's not carry it on for three or four generations. We don't need to do that. Today we live under a law of liberty, a law of freedom. We know that there is truth. And we know that Jesus says that truth makes us free. It will free us from sin in our lives. You'll turn your songbooks to 606. We've chosen that for an invitation. I think Emma wanted matchless love. It's the love that Jesus showed to us is the same kind of love that we should show for our children. Not tolerance, not acceptance 100% all the time, but love. The love that passes all understanding is what Jesus showed for us. Love for our children is what we should show as parents. If you're here today, you're subject to an invitation. If you're not right with God, just let us know how we can help you. And we'll do so any way we can. It's together we sing this song.